The Founder's Dilemmas. Um, that's a book I've read, and I'm going to give you my interpretation of that book in half an hour. Now, uh, Bruno Luaji, who is Bruno Luaji? Uh, I'm a developer. You see that because I wear a shirt and wear a shirt and a jeans. But you can also developers who know Stack Overflow, uh, they can see that I have a reputation of more than 20,000, so that's, that's good, that's proof that I'm the, a developer. Developers who don't know, uh, are there developers who don't know Stack Overflow? If so, you're busted because you're not really a developer. Um, I'm also the author of two books published by Manning Publication, iText in Action, and I'm the founder CEO of the iText Group, um, consisting of two companies in Belgium and one, co one company in the USA. Uh, as the previous speaker told you, uh, I've won some awards. Uh, last year, I was third in the Deloitte's Technology Fast 50. That's a competition where they look at your revenue over five years, and the fastest grower wins. So this year, I was uh, the winner in Belgium with a growth of 4,099%. Uh, a couple of weeks earlier, we also won the Belgium Entrepreneurship Award in the category, category Most Promising Company of the Year 2014. If you want to know more about Belgium, there's uh, Pilin there, and she has a buff, a birds of a feather, tonight at nine. So uh, if you want to know about doing business in Belgium and the States, uh, it's highly recommended to go to that buff. But now, so now about the book, uh, The Founder's Dilemmas. I never read management books. I like to learn, but I don't like to be taught. And many management books say, you have to do this, you have to do this. If you do this, you will be successful. Now, I fly a lot, so I, I spend a lot of time on airports, and every time to spend my time on the airport, I go to a bookshop and I turn some pages in, in books. And when I, when I looked at the first sentence of the founder's dilemmas, I read, it's unfortunate but true, if entrepreneurship is a battle, most casualties stem from friendly fire or self-inflicted wounds. And I said, that's how I experienced it. This is so true, I need to buy this book, I need to read this book. And so, during a flight from SFO to Amsterdam and from Amsterdam to Brussels and then the, taking the train, I've read this book, and it starts with two allegations. Allegation number one is, if you're an entrepreneur, you're rich. And if you're from Belgium, you know that there's a company called Omega Pharma. It has been sold for more than three billion, and the owner still owned half of the uh, shares, so he now has more than one and a half mil, uh, billion. Uh, and there have been demonstrations saying, hey, this can't be that this guy is so rich, he should pay taxes and he should give his money to, uh, to, to yeah, in the bottomless pit of, the, uh, of Belgium. That's, that's some, some uh, things that were published in the newspapers. But um, Wasserman, the, the author of The Founder's Dilemmas, he said, that was in the late 90s, early uh, 2000, he said, well, we know people like Mark Kuke or Larry Ellison, who have made a lot of money, but if you look, at, uh, if you look over a 10-year period, you see that uh, entrepreneurs earn 35% less than, they, than that they could have earned if they were employees. If you would look at the first 10 years of Mark Kuke's life in business, you would see that he invested in his company and that he lost money, so he, he was going negative, and he promised his wife, I'm going to be debtless before I'm 50. And I don't know how old he is, but he reached that goal. But had he done a job as employee in, in those 10 years, he would have had made more. And if you look at the whole career of an entrepreneur, if you look at the average, you see that entrepreneurs as a class make only as much money as they could have had if they had been employ employees. In fact, they make less because they take a higher risk. So it's all about averages. We look at the exceptions and we forget about all the people who don't make money with being an entrepreneur. Second allegation is, you're an entrepreneur because you like to be in control. So Wasserman did a study. He investigated with men and women, with people in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, and he asked them, in your career, what is important for you? And he didn't find that many differences between men and women or between generations. Sure, 
the older they got, the, 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 there was a shift in, in their aspirations and in, in what, the, what was important in their career. But he saw a clear difference between the people who were entrepreneurs and the people who were employee. Entrepreneurs, they said, we like power and influence. That's what keeps us going. Or we want autonomy. We want to be our own boss. Or we want to manage people. Whereas employees, they said, we want security. We want to be sure that we will still have a job in five years, in ten years. We want recognition. We want somebody to pat on our back and say, good job. Or we want affiliation. I work for Coca-Cola. I, this, this, I work for Google. So these are some differences between employees and entrepreneurs. But the allegation that entrepreneurs, being an entrepreneur equals control, well, he analyzed some startups and he saw that by the time ventures were three years old, 50% of the founders were no longer the CEO. So they gave up control in the first three years of their business. So that's the second myth that was busted. And he said, well, these are, this is research from other people. And he talked with entrepreneurs and he saw that um, if entrepreneurs had to make decisions, they had different options and they didn't always choose the option that would have made them the most money. So he said, why, why is this? What, what, what's, what's going on here? And he said, I need to do some research. So he, in, he uh, investigated with 10,000 companies between 2000 and 2009. So he followed these companies for 10 years. And he wrote this book saying, there are three, three groups of major decisions that you have to make when you create a company. You have to decide about founders, you have to decide about hires, and you have to decide about investors. So founders, either you go solo, in my case with iText, I'm a couplepreneur because it's my wife and I who, who are the founders, but it's very important to look at the three R's. What are the relationships between the founders? What are the roles? What are the rewards? The same three R's, R's he discusses them regarding hires. And then investors, decisions you have to make, are you going to bootstrap, to self-fund, or are you going to go for external outside capital? And what are the sources of capital? So you had the friends, fools, family, so you had in the previous talk, you had this, this, uh, these different categories. Um, and then what are the terms? You have investor-friendly terms or founder-friendly terms. And do you accept the board of directors? So these are key decisions that have to be made when you create a company. And then there are, in chapter 10, he discusses successors. So if you're a founder and a CEO, maybe at some point you will be asked to leave and to have another CEO for your company. So what is the trigger of succession? And how open are you to succession as the founder? Maybe you say, hey, I founded this company, I'm the CEO, and I'm the CEO for life. And if I'm forced to leave, well then, I am no longer working for this company. That's the de desired role after succession. Then he discusses some other factors, like the preferred rate of startup. How fast do you want to grow? Uh, can you afford to grow slowly? Or do you need to grow fast? Like Showpad, it's uh, a company that received some venture capital a week ago, and they really need that venture capital because they are, in, uh, they are a sales tool, and there are a lot of players on that market. So if they don't move fast, they might lose that market. Capital intensity, that's not about capital in the sense of uh, yeah, how much capital do you need. If you create software, you don't need that much capital. If you create hardware, maybe you have to build a plant, maybe you have to install machines. So that's, that's a higher capital in intensity. Core founders' capitals, that's not, ab not about money. That's about you're the founder, maybe you are a good business guy, but you don't have any techn technological knowledge. So you need a, a technical co-founder. Or you don't have any financial knowledge, so you need a, 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 a CFO as co-founder maybe. And so Wasserman looks at these decisions and he draws a quadrant. If you end up to the left in the quadrant, you are underperforming regarding the financial uh, goals. So you are not realizing the, the maximum financial uh, result that you could have. If you're on the right, you have built your financial maximum, uh, you have really created a lot of wealth. If you're in the lower half, you have little control over your company. And if you are in the upper half, you keep control over the company. And he says, well, 
when I study, study these 10,000 companies, I see that a lot of companies have consistently chosen for control decisions. And co-founders, they go solo, or in Belgium, when you start a company and you, you are the only founder, you need to start an EBVBA, and that's not really interesting to start an EBVBA, but if you want a BVBA, which is more interesting, then you need to at least two founders. So what you will do is, I'll take my father as a co-founder, and he will never uh, harass me about my business, I can do my thing, and he's just like a straw puppet. You will choose your founders from your immediate circle, You'll build a CEO, so from your immediate circle, that's the relationships. Uh, I once went to, uh, on Sand Hill Road to a, a VC, and so I was there with my wife, and he asked, what's the relationship between you two? And we said, yeah, we're married. Oh, conversa conversation stopped, because if your marriage goes bad, business will hurt. If there's a problem in business, your marriage will hurt. So I'm not investing in couples. <laughs> so that was the, the advice of a, of a VC. And co-founders, they will maintain the, the most equity. So I want to, I'm the owner, I'm the founder, I should have 100% of the equity. Hires, you look in your close uh, personal network and you'll keep control of key decisions. After reading the book, I realized that with ITEX, we've always gone for, key, for control decisions because nobody else in the company was allowed to sign a document. So every document that was for, of importance, it had to come to me and I had to sign it. If you're, if you're successful, that becomes a burden. Um, you hire less expensive juniors. That's in your hires, that's, that's a typical control decision. Investors, you, know, you will self-fund and maybe you'll get some money from friends, fools and family, but you'll resist investor-friendly friendly tar terms and you'll avoid an official board. Back in the old days, I said, hey, it's my company. I don't need a board deciding for me. I've changed uh, over, the, over the time, and now we have a board. And now I say, huh, no, I, I have a board that can make decisions. And it's not only on my shoulders that the, the, the uh, responsibility is resting. And control decisions, most of the time, Wasserman noticed that C founder CEOs resisted to give up their CEO position. They only left if they were forced, if things went bad with the company. And so that's what he discusses in chapter 10. Other factors that are an immediate like, uh, result of going for control decisions is that you will have gradual to moderate growth. With iText, we kind of grew to, with, uh, we are a company between five to $10 million uh, revenue a year. We're not a billion dollar company. And that's uh, a result of, of having chosen for control decisions. So low capital intensity. There are companies in Belgium. I, I know a, a company owner, he, he says, well, I try to keep my revenue under 1 million euro because if I make more than 1 million euro, I can't manage my company. So, so that's, that's maybe a personal uh, uh, opinion of that entrepreneur. And other factors to, that allow you to take control decisions, if, if you can build a startup without help, then you can afford taking control decisions. But if you don't know how to run a business, if, you don't, if you're not a technical guy or, or not a business guy, if you, you're missing some of these core co uh, capitals, control decisions will be more difficult. But the result of control decisions is the most likely outcome. You'll maintain control, but you'll bu build less value. And in Wasserman's book, you're a king. You're in that quadrant. You're the king of your company, but uh, you're happy with the money you make. And Wasserman, one of the things I like about the book, he doesn't judge. He doesn't say you have to take control decisions, you have to take wealth decisions. In my mother tongue, they say, zin en andere, so translated in uh, English, you need a diversity. You can't have a world where you have only million dollar companies and employees. You need an ecosystem of big companies and small companies. So it's not bad to go for control decisions. It's not bad to go for wealth decisions either. Uh, wealth decisions, co-founders, you'll build the team. You'll take the best CFO, the best CTO, and the best CEO, and these guys don't know each other. Uh, there was a, in the, the Fast 50, there was a Chinese girl who said, I founded a company with somebody I met on the train, and then we, we uh, went to the airport, and then we met a, a third guy, and we talked about our ID, and we were the co-founders, and we didn't know each other, but, but a week later we had a company. And 
that's a typical wealth decision. You, you, you find the best founders, and you delegate decision makers. As the CEO, you, don't, you, you leave the financial decisions to your CFO, because he's the expert, and you trust him with it. You leave the technical decisions, decisions to your CTO. You don't interfere, and you share equity. Now, there's a big danger there. If you are three co-founders and you say, we are going to split the shares evenly, so 33, 33, 33, you will always have one founder who works his ass off, who works day and night. You will have one founder who works normal hours, and you will have a third founder who sits back and watches the other work. And that's, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So his advice, Wasserman's advice is, if you start, try to start in an informal way and try to postpone uh, sharing the equity. As for hires, you hire experienced employees, um, like Dries Beutart with uh, Drupal and Acquia. His advice is, I hire ahead of the curve. If I need a marketing guy in six months, I hire him now, I train him, I bleed money, but when I need him, in six months, he'll be ready. At iText, we hired when it hurt. So we were like five people, we had too much work for, for us five. We hired an extra person because we needed an extra one. But then we had even more work because we had to train this extra guy. And so before this extra, extra guy started uh, taking away work for, from us, yeah, that, that's, that really hurt. It. So uh, that's a result of a, a control decision. And you'll incent with cash or equity. And you'll delegate decision make, making. So for instance, if you hire somebody who is uh, like responsible for uh, buying products, you will give him the authority, a power of authority, to sign documents, and you'll trust this guy with, 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 this, uh, th with these decisions. As for investors, you'll, tar you'll take outside capital, or depending on, on how much money you need, you'll target angels or VCs, and you'll be open to terms, you'll be open to losing control. As for successors, when you go for wealth decisions, you kind of... See, well, in control decisions, uh, a CEO says, well, I was the CEO when we started, then I was the CEO when we made five million, and now we're taking the company to the next level. I did well in the first two levels, I'll, be, I'll do well in the third level. And that's not always true, because your qualities as a CEO in the first stage of your company, being a CEO in the second stage of your company, requires different skills. Being a CEO in the third stage requires other skills. And so maybe it's good that you kind of predict when it's time to step back and when it's time to give up be, being the CEO. And in the context of wealth decisions, what Ross Wasserman uh, noticed was that uh, people who step back as CEO, they remain an executive because they have all this expertise in the company and they don't really care that somebody else is in charge now. Other factors is uh, wealth decisions, if you need fast or explosive growth, so I, I already, already talked about Showpad, uh, it's a highly competitive market, so they really need to grow fast to, to, to not lose the market. Or if you need high capital intensity, so if you need to build something, if you're, you're selling hardware, then, then you need that start capital. Or, so other factors when you choose to go for wealth decisions is if you need to fill gaps. So you have some qualities that you have like 30% of the qualities and you need to fill out the gaps, that, that the things that you can't do, the skills that you are missing, then wealth decisions could be the, the path for you. The most likely income is that you'll build financial value, but your imperial control, you'll be in the rich quadrant. That's that quadrant. Now, the question is, why isn't it possible? So isn't it possible to be in the upper right quadrant, where you are king and rich? Well, it's not real math, but Wasserman uses math to explain something. He says it's impossible if you look at founders, hires, and investors. These are the three key decisions. It's in, un, impossible to go for 100% control decisions. It's impossible to go for 100% uh, wealth decisions. But, for instance, if you go to be king, you take 80% control decisions for founders, 80% for uh, control decisions for hires, 80% for uh, investors, and 20% you go for wealth decisions. Then, if you do that consistently, you have a 51% probability that you'll be king, 
and a 1% probability that you'll be rich. And then if you go for being rich and you switch the, the decisions, it's the other way around. The danger is if you go for something in between, if you mix control decisions and you mix wealth decisions, then, for instance, you say 80% control decisions for uh, founders, 80% for uh, hires, and 20% for investors' control decisions, your probability that you'll be king drops from, from 51% to 13%, but your probability to be rich only increases from 1% to 3%. So, if you want to be in that uh, quadrant, you're the exception. Why does everybody know Larry Ellison? Why does everybody know Bill Gates? That's because they are exceptions. If you mix control and wealth decisions, there's a higher chance that you end up in that quadrant, that you, your business fails. So, uh, after reading the book, I tweeted, I finished reading The Founder's Dilemmas. I've made half of the mistakes explained in the book, but I'm looking forward to making the other half. So I realized that with iTex we had made all these control decisions, and now the plan for the next three years is to slowly change the control decisions into wealth decisions, knowing very well which risks are involved. Now, um, we had this discussion in the previous talk about uh, what is better? Is it better to have 1% of a billion or 100% of a million? And investors really like to come with this story about the pie. But uh, that's, that's what they want you to see. Now, seen from the VC side, he may have a billion dollar company in his portfolio. But for every company like that in his portfolio, he has a number of companies that are only 10 million dollar companies. And then he has even more that, yeah, aren't worth anything. Well, maybe the, the, the thousand dollars in equipment, and that's all the company is worth. So it's very important if you go uh, and work with a VC, it's very important that if you're one of those companies that you realize that very fast, that you don't make the, the, the how do you say that, uh, that you don't uh, make a, a really uh, high investment if you see that it's, it's, it's going bad, stop and try again. Maybe you'll end up in the 10 million. And if that works out, uh, yeah, that's so, so really think about if you go with the VC, it's, it's, it's a risk you take. Now, this is, these are, uh, number, this is a number from uh, October this year. And for the third straight quarter, there were more, more than 150 private tech company exits in Europe. And 12% of these tech exits were venture backed. That means that 88% of the successful exits were not venture-backed. So what, what I find awkward is that when you read the newspapers, you always read about the companies that get venture capital. You always read about, hey, this company got $8.5 million, but yeah, that's, you never hear about the bootstrappers. And so one more thing, raising money isn't impressive, Making money is. So um, it has been said in previous talks uh, before, um, if you have an ID and you go to a, a, a VC, the VC will ask a big share if you only have an ID. First, before going to a VC, try to find some customers. Let your customers be your first investors. And if you have a number of customers and you go to a VC saying, hey, look, I'm I'm not profitable yet, but I'm already making revenue, then you have a much better negotiation position. So that's my uh, take on the founder's dilemmas, and it's a little bit different from the view of the investor, but uh, if you have questions, then I'm here to answer them. Thank you. I took this picture because uh, in the States you have the shark tank, and, but the UK version is the dragon's den, so I'm kind of <laughs> getting near the dragon. No questions? Okay. Ah. Ah, okay. What was the change or decision or thing that changed after which iTex really um, 
different decisions. So it's it's two parts. Um, first, I my initial idea with iTex was if I don't ask for any money, I won't have any worries. So I, I put iTex out, free as in free beer, and everybody started to using it. Now, if I, no money, no worries was very naive, because before I knew it, I didn't have a life anymore, because everybody was asking technical questions. So I took some vacation, I wrote a free online tutorial, and before I knew it, the free online tutorial was a big success, and I was offered a book contract, so I wrote a book, and after the book, there were not only technical questions, but legal questions, so I did a, uh, an IP review, and after the IP, IP review, I said, hey, I'm just a person without a company, and if something goes wrong with ITEX, then I'm personally liable. And so I put the IP into a company, and we started doing business. But business with a product that is free as in free beer is very difficult. We had uh, customers that were really afraid of open source, like banks and insurance companies, but as open source was becoming mainstream, it was more difficult to, to make money with something as free as in free beer. So we changed the license from the MPL LGPL, which is a, a rather liberal, liberal, liberal license, to the AGPL, which is a viral license. Many people hated me for it, but it was really needed to make revenue to further support the, the product. For instance, one of the open source competitors is PDF Box. They were at the PDF days uh, last year, and they said, hey, PDF 2.0 is coming, so the new uh, PDF spec, but we don't have any funds to support everything in PDF 2.0, so we're not going to do it. Now that we have revenue, we can go to the ISO meetings, we follow all the new specs, all the new evolutions on PDF, and we are very close to, so before the, the, the spec, before the ISO standard is even accepted, we are already ready with ITEX to support that spec. And so that's we still had control decisions, so the other change we made is now we are going to go to wealth decisions, and we made a business plan for three years, and for instance, the hires, we no longer look in our immediate circle for hires. We took Hudson. Hudson is a, a, an international HR uh, consultant, and we said, Hudson, we need these and these and these profiles, and yes, we want you to find the best of breed. So we are paying a lot to Hudson, more than we did when we looked in our own circles. We are paying, so some of the, old, older, some of the first employees, the company was growing, but the, the employees weren't growing with the company, so we had to let them go. So uh, one of the, the key things that I, I, so when we made the decision, I had just watched the, the Startup Secrets by Michael J. Scott. I don't know if you know him. He used to work for Nordbridge, uh, a VC in, in uh, in uh, Boston, and he has this series on, on YouTube, Startup Secrets. And one of the things he said is, no company has ever fired an employee too early. And so that's, that's some of the more difficult decisions. That's a well decision. It's a very hard decision, firing, your first, firing the, an employee for the first time. But sometimes it's necessary. And so that's no, with, with, after seeing the Startup Secrets, I'm, and, and after reading the book, I'm trying to yeah, navigate a small control-based company into a company that can grow not only between five and ten million dollars, but that can go beyond the ten million dollars. Yeah. Uh, uh, I so I founded my first company in 2008, and I had a day job until 2010, and. So the free online tutorial, it was published in 2004, and I was one of the first people who had Google AdSense ads on his site. And so back in those days, I made like $1,200 a month in AdSense revenue, and then I had the book, so I made, with my first book, I made about $25,000. So using the ads revenue and the revenue from the royalties from my book, I was able to fund my own company, my first company. I, I'm going to say something that will haunt me. Um, I started my job in the private sector as an employee, and then I switched to being a civil servant. <laughs> and as being a civil servant, you have 35 vacation days a year, so whereas in the private sector you only have 20. And, and yeah, that's <laughs> 
if, if, if I, I, I've been uh, in the private sector an employee, I've been a civil servant, and I've been an entrepreneur. If you look at uh, price quality, being a civil servant is like the best deal. But if you would ask me, will you ever return to being a civil servant? No, <laughs> sorry. I like being an entrepreneur more. Okay, sorry. I, have to, I see that I have to stop. Thank you.